Welcome back to the Lions College Football Podcast. I am Brett Gibbons with Lions.com, and I am joined once again, as always, by Kelly Ford. Kelly, welcome back. Thanks for joining me, and how have you been? I'm great, Brett. We are getting into the meat of conference play now for most of these conferences. A lot of the games we're going to be talking about uh, on this midweek podcast and then also the Saturday slate are conference games. And to me, those are some of the most fun and exciting, only topped by rivalry games. And of course, oftentimes there's overlap there. So uh, we've learned a lot through the non-conference portion of this season, but we're going to learn even more now that we get into these conference games. Yeah, just looking at our notes for this episode, this is going to be, uh, this might be a long one. It, even though there's only five games, uh, standard weeknight, Thursday, Friday slate, uh, but we've got a lot of good information here. Before we get into all that, though, don't forget to follow the lines on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it these days at the Lines US. I am at Road to CFB, and Kelly's work can be frou- found at K Ford Ratings. We'll be here every single week breaking down the college football slate as well as the individual weeknight games which is what we're here to do today. We are already in week four. We have a Big Ten West rivalry on tap, some Mountain West after dark action, a couple other good ones, Uh, lots of pretty even matchups too. There are no double-digit spreads at time of recording uh, this round. But I want to start off with uh, Thursday's only game. We have Georgia State at Coastal Carolina. Coastal Carolina is a a six-and-a-half-point home favorite. This game carries an over-under of 63 points. Kicks off at 7.30 p.m. Eastern on Thursday on ESPN. Now, this isn't actionable advice. It's interesting, so I wanted to put it in here anyway, but do beware of trends and things like that. I don't think this is terribly actionable. But these teams have played each other six times, and no one has won two in a row. They trade it off every year. And interestingly, it's always the road team that's won this matchup. It's a fun series. The 2021 installment was just incredible, 42-40 shootout. Uh, that Georgia State ended up taking. But since Jamie Chadwell left for Liberty, uh, Coastal's offensive efficiency is just absolutely tanked. They're 102nd in EPA per rush, 99th in success rate. And along with it, I think he tanks Grayson McCall's NFL draft stock. Uh, He is no longer atop of all the passing uh, stat boards like we're used to seeing. Now his passer rating is close to Taven Jackson, who is Indiana's uh, rotational quarterback. I guess they, they play with two. And A.J. Swan of Vanderbilt. Now, not terrible quarterbacks, but not Grayson McCall. We're used to seeing him at the top of of passing boards uh, year in and year out. He used to be super uh, hyper-efficient, honestly. Uh, And uh, Tim Beck has effectively come in and ruined that like he has many other stops along the way. Uh, They run a pretty, what I think, to be a remedial offensive system now. They don't have that creative triple option that you don't even realize you're watching option football because it's so spread and multiple and and pass-heavy. And they do still throw a lot of short passes, which we expect in the preseason, except to Sam Pickney, uh, they just bomb it downfield to him. But there, there's really just no creativity with this offense, I don't think. They're not getting a push up front either. They're the seventh worst run blocking team, according to Pro Football Focus. On the other side, Georgia State. They are much better at defending the run than the pass. So we're not going to be seeing a run heavy approach from the Chanticleers, I don't believe. Outside of one 58-yard rush that they gave up in their Charlotte game, Georgia State has not allowed more than 50 yards rushing to a single player all season yet. 17 yards was all it took to be the leading rusher for UConn when they took on Georgia State a couple weeks back. But there are few worse teams in the country than Georgia State against the pass. It's 121st in EPA per attempt. Darren Granger, the quarterback, he's a lot more efficient as a passer this year. I think he's come a long way. 72% completion in this young season versus just completing 58.5% of his passes last year. He's still a dual threat, but he's a lot pickier with his spots, which I think is to his benefit. It's helped him a lot. The back, Marcus Carroll, has also been excellent on the ground. Seven touchdowns, rushing touchdowns, actually leads the nation currently. Uh, and Coastal's, predictably, he, they're just terrible against the run. Bottom 15 in EPA per rush and success rate allowed. So much good stuff there, Brett, and I still can't get over the very first thing you said about the road teams always won in this series. Like, I wasn't tracking on that. I think that's an amazing stat. I know you say it's not actionable. It's not. But also, last week, we talked about Tennessee hadn't won at the Swamp since 2003. Oh, it's not actionable. Well... They still haven't won in the Swamps since 2003. So it's just interesting how some of these things go. I I very much like that. 
Coastal Carolina has been my favorite in the East all season. They started the year with a 30% chance to win the East. It is now up to a season high 45% chance due to the increase in their power rating and then also the decrease or or just change in power ratings to their main competitors in the East and also the opponents that they're facing uh, throughout the year, uh, including the team in this game. There are nine games left in the regular season. There isn't a single one in which my numbers make the Chanticleers an underdog. However, five of them have a projected spread of a, of a touchdown or less. This isn't one of those, though. I have Coastal minus 10 with a 77% win expectancy. Coastal Carolina was my number three biggest upgrade in the power ratings from last week behind only uh, Sunbelt rival South Alabama and Boston College in a loss to Florida State, interestingly enough. Uh, now power rated number 56. The Shants have the second best defense in the division. It's ranked number 67 behind only Marshall. Uh, but it's the offense that's actually the better of the two units. I know you've talked about what that looks like this year versus previous years. I have them ranked number 48 nationally right now. Georgia State, uh, that's offensive unit rank. Georgia State is off to a 3-0 and start. They rank as my number 12 biggest overachiever to this point of the season with 0.9, almost one full win more than my preseason realistic expectations projected through week three. However, the Panthers have not faced a team power rated better than number 110, an offense power rated better than number 125, and a defense power rated better than number 110. This Coastal Carolina team will be by far their biggest test of the season, and it's on the road. Although, as you said, maybe that doesn't matter in this series, but uh, it is it is on the road. You, do, you are factoring in a, a home field advantage here for the Chanticleers. Georgia State's number 40 ranked offense is the best offense in the division, and it's the best unit in this game. But their number 112 defense, you touched on this, by far the worst. I just don't see this Panther defense getting enough stops to get the win in this one. I have Coastal Carolina minus 10, a 23% chance that Georgia State pulls off the upset on the road. Brett, now that we're into conference play, I talked about I'm excited for that. I want to give the listeners and the viewers, if you're on YouTube, just a quick snapshot of what does this game do to the conference championship game projections with everything else equal? Of course, as all games are played, power ratings are going to change. I talked about earlier with Coastal Carolina and how it's changed. But assuming all else equal, right now, Coastal Carolina has a 45% chance to make the conference championship game, as I mentioned. Georgia State's at a 4% chance. With a win, all else equal, Coastal Carolina goes up to a 50% chance, and Georgia State would fall to a 2. They would lose in the scenario. If Georgia State were to win, their chances rise to 13% to win the East, while Coastal Carolina's drops to 26. So it's interesting, all else equal, as things stand, even with a loss, Coastal Carolina still has a better chance to make the conference championship game than Georgia State, who would be a game up with the tiebreaker, because that's how my numbers are projecting Coastal Carolina currently versus Georgia State. So I'm going to give that little tidbit for all the conference games we talk about, which will be most games moving forward, but that's kind of how we'll do that there. Um, And I'll say it slowly the first couple times so folks can keep up. I'm sure it'll catch on uh, after a while. I don't often fly in the face of your power ratings and projections. Uh, There's a big reason we have you on the show and your your projections are very (laughs) accurate, but I am going to fly in the face of them this time. I actually took Georgia State plus seven on the road here on Thursday. I like their ability to break off explosive runs. They already have two yards of or two rushes of 60-plus yards on the season, and there's not many teams worse that you can find even over the past five years against the run than Coastal. I don't trust Coastal Carolina's offensive system enough to separate if they can't slow down the run. Uh, This could be a big back-and-forth type of thing, and if that's the case, I'm taking the points with Georgia State here. Uh, My numbers, which are aggregated power ratings, which do factors yours in there, um, they make it just a hair under six So I do see a little bit of value uh, betting it through the key number of seven. And Brett, I appreciate the kind words, and I'm excited that I'm in your aggregated power ratings this year now that I've changed my scale. Uh, That's great. Uh, It's very cool, and I like to be a part of those different things. I will say, and this this has really come to my attention the more I've gotten out there and done different podcasts and done the show here with you. It, it see, and I know why this happens. It seems like uh, in games in which we're talking about, those are the biggest games. Those are the games that are attracting the most attention. Those are the games that odds makers are paying the most attention to. My numbers, funny enough, do much better in terms of absolute air in the off the radar games, the games that no one talks about or cares about, than they do in these big time games. And that's because the line is just that much sharper 
when this when the when the public puts the magnifying glass on this and you say well kelly they're not putting the magnifying glass on georgia state and coastal carolina guys yeah they are it's the only game on thursday everybody who likes college football is gonna be watching this game and yeah they're gonna have the amazon prime going to of the nfl game so it's just interesting if you are to fly in the face of my numbers i would encourage you to do it actually in the games that we're talking about because those are the ones in which i see a higher absolute error than the ones that we don't and i wish it wasn't that way but i understand why it is and our listeners are probably like oh yeah sure okay kelly i'm telling you i got the data to back it up so it's just interesting it's not like a huge discrepancy but there is a slightly better absolute error on those off the radar games that don't have as much attention yeah and that matters why do you think i talk about an fcs game every every week it's <laughs> it's an information battle and when it comes to college football when you're betting a saturday slate with 74 games and you pick out Old Dominion, Louisiana, you're going to have a much bigger edge yep. than if you're trying to bet Ohio State, Notre Dame upcoming or yep. an NFL game. It's a lot softer of a market. So I totally understand why your numbers would be ahead of those uh, smaller market, kind of more numerous games rather than the prime times uh, and, and the big boys. But moving forward, we're talking about a matchup that I know is very near and dear to your heart, Kelly. We have the Wisconsin Badgers, a six-point road favor at Purdue this game has an over-under of 53.5 points. It kicks off on Friday at 7 p.m. Eastern. Again, if you're not watching the high school Friday Night Lights, this may be a great Sickos matchup for you in the Big Ten West on FS1. Uh, they first played this uh, rivalry in 1892. Kelly, we're talking about pre-1900s uh, ongoing rivalries here. Wisconsin, though, uh, well, they've taken 16 straight. The last time Purdue has beaten the Badgers was in 2003, led by Kyle Orton former uh, NFL quarterback. They uh, they fare a little bit better at home than on the road, expectedly, uh, but their average scoring margin since 2003 is minus 16.6 in West Lafayette versus minus 22.6 in Madison. So about a touchdown difference there. Uh, Wisconsin, a, a very injured team. I've talked about it a couple of times here. Uh, their top six tight ends are either questionable or out. And when I say out, I mean for the year. Uh, they are just banged up at that position. Also, starting center Jake Renfro has yet to play this year. Uh, he's out indefinitely, quote unquote, with a uh, with a foot injury. And I think that the injuries and the fact that this is a new offensive system has just taken a while to take its roots. It, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot here. Do you have any guess as to who leads Wisconsin in receptions after three games? My, my guess would be. Skylar Bell, but I'm assuming since you're asking the question, I'm probably not right, but that's who I would go with just off the roster of Wisconsin that I have on the top of my head. It is running back Braylon Allen with 15 receptions as we speak it today. I should have uh, been smart. I should have known that because you're asking the question. I should have guessed that. Uh, the Crazy. Badgers are, are 93rd in EPA per pass. Tanner Mordecai this season has two touchdowns to four turnover-worthy throws and a career-low 6.9 yards per attempt. Like I said, taking a little while. To get, uh, to get the new offensive system to establish its roots under Phil Longo. Uh, but Braylon Allen does have a career high, 7.1 yards per attempt. I would attribute that to not facing eight-man boxes. Uh, finally, they said before the year that he was really excited not to have to deal with. On the Purdue side, their defense is an issue. No two ways about it. Fresno State had their way through the air. Then Garrett Schrader this past week just came out and rushed for 200 yards on them. Uh, so they need to clean it up both through the air and against the run. They've given up the seventh most 20-yard uh, plays this season with 22 of them just through the three games. Uh, and they're also one of the worst tackling teams. Uh, they have the ninth most missed tackles in the country. Their defensive line is playing fine. They're, they're getting, uh, giving up about one point, one and a quarter line yards per carry. But uh, the second level just isn't getting it done. Lots of missed tackles, allowing a lot of what they call highlight yards, which is what the running back produces after they get past the line of scrimmage. Um, and then the offensive side, Purdue's offensive line is also an issue. They're 123rd in EPA per rush, just a 36% success rate. That's 108th nationally. Uh, Devin Mockaby, though, he's been pretty good. 16 missed tackles forced. That's top 20 in the country. But he's also fumbled the football three times. Wisconsin, you can run on them, which is uh, surprising because they've been pretty stout defensively. But they do limit big plays. They're 17th in EPA per rush, but their 44% success rate allowed is a bottom 30 number nationally. So you can get chunks of yards, but you may not be ripping off the 50-plus yarder on them. They've allowed 11 runs of uh, 10 or more yards, but just one over 20 and none that have hit 30 so far on the year, just to kind of illustrate that. But Kelly, how do you break down this Big Ten West matchup featuring your school? 
Yeah, uh, the Boilers need to bounce back. Uh, they haven't won at home yet this year. I'll get into that in a second. Uh, there's only one. I'm talking about Wisconsin first because that's what I do. I talk about the teams that my numbers project to win first. Winners first. Took that one from Josh Pate. I think it's a good rule of thumb. There is only one game the rest of the year in which my numbers project Wisconsin as an underdog. It's a Week 9 home game against Ohio State. However, for the first time all season, Wisconsin is not currently my favorite to win the West Division. The Badgers and Hawkeyes both have a 39% chance to make it to Indianapolis, with my numbers giving Iowa just the slightest of edges. We're talking decimal points uh, as it breaks down here. The reason for this, even though Wisconsin's favorite in every game but one, there are four games in which the Badgers are projected as a favorite of a touchdown or less. This is one of those games. I have Wisconsin minus 6.5, uh, 68% win expectancy. The Badgers came into the year power rated number 19, number 11 defense, number 43 offense. Now, Wisconsin's number 31 overall with the number 15 defense and the number 55 offense. Uh, So they are down across the board here. However, even at number 55 on the offensive side, this is still the best offense in the Big Ten West. (laughs) Brett, the number 15, (laughs) number 55 is the best offense. Brett, a number 15 defense, only the third best defense in the division. So oh you have the number 15 goodness. defense. It's third best in the division. 55 offense is number one. I was actually looking at it. This made me curious. Three of my top five defenses overall are in the Big Ten, and they're actually in, in, in the Big Ten. Sorry, four of the top five, they're in the Big Ten. Three of them are in the East. I have Iowa number one, Michigan number two, Penn State at number four, I think, and Ohio State number five with Georgia mixed in there too. A lot of good defense in the Big Ten, at least right now, by my numbers. We'll see how that changes, if at all, moving forward. For Purdue... First-year head coach, Ryan Walters, still looking for his first win at home, like I mentioned, after non-conference losses in Ross State Stadium to Fresno State to open the year and then Syracuse just this past weekend on NBC primetime. Uh, like Wisconsin, Purdue is down across the board compared to the preseason. Power rated number 66 overall, number 57 offense, number 79 defense. While the offense is the second best in the division behind this Wisconsin Badgers, the defense is dead last in the division. That, to me, is going to be the difference in this game, as Wisconsin does have the advantage on both sides of the ball. Yes, this game is is in West Lafayette. It hasn't mattered yet for Purdue. And knowing that this is how it goes with Purdue. It's when you don't expect them to win that they are able to pull off an upset and get it done. And I say this as someone who has seen this over and over. It's when Purdue is pr- expected to win, like they were against Fresno State, that they can't get it done. So it'll be interesting. I have Wisconsin minus 6.5. It's a 32% chance for Purdue to pull off the upset win at home. Here we go. Wisconsin, 39% chance to win the West currently. Purdue, 2% chance. All else equal, if Wisconsin wins, that goes up to 45%. Purdue with that loss would go to 1%. If Purdue were to win, they're up to a 6% chance to go to Indy, where they were last year, and Wisconsin would be at a 25% chance with a loss. It helps Wisconsin that they get that Iowa game at home later in the year. That's helping them in the projections. That is in Week 7. Uh, Very well could be the decider in the Big Ten West, but I feel like I say that almost every year, and it almost every year turns out not to be, at least in recent history, so we'll see how that goes. But that's what the numbers say about wins and losses in this game for these two contenders in the Big Ten West. Looks like we're both in agreement here, and uh, our numbers are in agreement with the market. Uh, you said minus six and a half, sitting at minus six. You can find a six and a half if you really are so obligated to. Uh, I see like seven, six. That that's pretty much a fair line. Uh, I think I lean under if anything in this matchup, uh, just because I don't know if Purdue's gonna be able to move the ball on Wisconsin. To be honest here, um, especially with those offensive line issues and the inability to tackle, just to be able to, you know, they're not gonna be able to, to speed the game up. It's probably gonna be slowed down to the way Wisconsin wants to play it. Uh, and if we're looking at 53 and a half, 54, probably lean under. Um, but that's that's the most action that that I would uh, that I would have in this game here. Moving forward to the ACC, NC State is a nine and a half point favorite on the road at Virginia. This game carries an over under of 46 and a half points. Game kicks off Friday night at 7:30 p.m. Eastern on ESPN. Virginia once again getting a prime time national uh, spotlight here. I'll be honest, Kelly, it was actually kind of fun watching uh, Anthony Calandria just be a complete gunslinger against Maryland last week. He had an average depth of target of 12.6 with five, count it, five turnover-worthy throws in a singular game. There was a lot of unfounded confidence, uh, which was fun for the first half until he threw three consecutive interceptions on three consecutive uh, passing attempts there in the second half. 
I'm not sure if Tony Musket goes. He was dressed, but obviously he didn't play. Uh, I don't know if you picked up on this. This was a remote broadcast for Maryland, Virginia last week. Uh, I, I thought it was awful. Uh, they didn't know that Tony Muska was out. Uh, Roman Hemby disappeared for a series. They couldn't tell if he was in, out, it, flags. They, it, it was it was a wreck. Uh, I hope that they don't do that anymore. Fox, don't do not do that, please. Uh, Virginia, though, complete, like, utter mess. Uh, they can't move the ball very well, and they can't really stop opponents from moving the ball very well. Not much more to say on, on the who's at the moment. I, I just don't have a lot of breakdown for this. They're, they're just bad. NC State, on the other hand, Brennan Armstrong. Brennan Armstrong transfers in. This is a little bit of a revenge game against his former team in Virginia. He's looked bad, but I don't know that it's really all his fault. I'm going to make a little bit of a case for it, and knowing this, he's going to come out and throw like three interceptions that are all egregious. He's dealing with a really bad wide receiver core. They have 10 drops through three games, which is the second most among teams that have three games. 13.2% of all of his passes have been dropped so far this year. He only has three turnover-worthy throws, but three interceptions. And now I do have to note that not all interceptions come off of turnover-worthy throws, but not many guys nationally have an equal or greater interception to turnover-worthy throw ratio uh, than, than Brennan Armstrong here. So a little bit of bad luck on his end there. And he's been using his legs pretty well. Uh, he's only been sacked three times, and he has 17 scrambles, so he's being able to get out of there when there is pressure on him. Uh, fortunately, he's not going to have to worry about much of a pass rush this week. Uh, Virginia's 3% sack rate is 114th nationally so far through our three and a half weeks. Uh, NC State's defense is all right, but I do think they have some issues allowing explosive runs. But I don't think Virginia's going to be a team to exploit that. How do your numbers shake this one out? Brett, this is a rough game. I, I, there's no way to sugarcoat it. It's a rough game. You said that Purdue, Wisconsin could be kind of a sickos game. Brett, th- th- this is a sickos game. There, yeah. I mean, I'm looking yeah. at Virginia's team sheet, which again, or team dashboard gets updated every Tuesday on the website. There's a lot of red, dude. And it doesn't help oh, yeah. that their color is orange. So it kind of like blends into that too. But even with their color it could be green and there'd be a lot of red on this thing. Uh, listen, uh, the good news here. One of these teams is going to win a conference game. Like one of these teams is going to get a win. They're going to be one and zero in the conference and feeling okay about themselves going into week five. The Wolfpack offense has been. I sorry. I have NC State minus ten and a half, seventy seven percent chance to win. Wolfpack offense has been exactly what I expected from the preseason. The defense has been much worse, falling from number eighteen in the preseason to number thirty eight currently. That's still not bad. Uh, number thirty eight, top forty defense. That's not bad. But when you're projected top twenty. I mean, that's a pretty significant fall. They were as low as number 47 uh, last week before what, what was a really good performance against VMI out of, VMI. Out of the FCS. But, hey, <laughs> we're account, we're adjusting for the opponents there, and they're up to number 38 now. So uh, we'll take that. But that's why, because the defense has fallen, this team has fallen from number 40 to number 52 in my power ratings. Their win total projection has fallen from 7.0 with an 84% chance to go bowling to a 6.0 with a 64% chance to go bowling. There's even less good news for Virginia, Brett. The the offense has improved from number 125 to number 113. The defense has fallen from number 27, which by the way, shame on me, hand up, just a ba- just a bad projection, like should have been better, should have known better. They're down to number 83. Uh the team overall has fallen from number 85 to number 100. It's the worst in the ACC. It's the eighth largest downgrade by rating, not ranking, by rating for any team this season. It's just all bad news. It gets worse, Brett. There isn't a single game remaining on the Cavs schedule in which my numbers favor UVA. That includes a week six home game against FCS, William, and Mary. Yes, I make the Hoos a one-point dog in a game against an FCS team at home. That's how bad it is right now in Charlottesville. Uh, The win total projection falling from 3.7 to 2.0. Chances to go bowling have decreased from 12% in the preseason to now currently less than 1%. I have NC State minus 10.5. There is a 23% chance that Virginia pulls off the upset at home. This is a really simple one. NC State currently a 2% chance to make the conference championship game. With a win, stays at 2%. With a loss, it drops to less than 1%. Virginia currently with a less than 1% chance to make it. With a win or a loss, it remains less than a 1% chance to make it. That's what happens when you're power rated number 100 in a power 5 conference. Oh my god, give me more in a field goal with William and Mary, please. I don't think they'll do it, but please give me 3 and a half. With William and Mary, and I, I will absolutely, I'll, I'll take them all day. I'm telling uh, you, you could take a money line potentially. Yeah, and again, maybe, who, who, who knows? But yikes, dude, yikes. 
Yeah, yikes. I mean, William Mary's pretty good, but uh, we're just that. Yeah, that Brett, there's a Power great. 5 team. We're not <laughs> just talking it, FBS versus FCS. Is it? Th- th- sorry, <laughs> by conference affiliation, yeah, you are. And you need to start playing like it. And, and hey, let's, I should also say, I understand it's about more than football right now at Virginia. What they went through this past year, horrific. Uh, you never, n- no co- college, no, no person should have to go through that, let alone a team, let alone when you're trying to play football. Like, it just puts the whole your whole life into perspective, your whole purpose on this earth into perspective. For the purposes of this podcast, which is college football related, that is the lens in, through which I am focusing my analysis of Virginia. So I am not tone deaf to everything else going on there. What I am saying is that the product on the field, perhaps understandably, given some of the other things happening, has not been good, and it's getting worse. So... Again, College Football Podcast, that's what we're talking about here. I understand everything else. That is way more important than anything we're discussing. But you guys are listening to hear about college football. That's where I'm going with the analysis. Um, yeah, I'm not really sure I want to lay basically 10 on the road with NC State. Uh, I can't trust their offense enough. That said, I wouldn't be surprised if this was a 31-3 victory or another 42-14 blowout or you know something along those lines. But uh, my confidence isn't really high laying uh, essentially 10, you, you need NC State to win by 10 to cover the nine and a half point spread on the road. Uh, they didn't really impress me against UConn. Uh, I know the Notre Dame game was weird, and, and Notre Dame is a very, very good football team right now. Uh, but then they played VMI, who's, I have them eight, ranked 88th uh, in the FCS, so not great. Uh, they're not a team that beats themselves, though. They have fewer than 30 penalty yards per game uh, against FBS opponents. That's 13th least in the country. So at least they're not going to be shooting themselves in the foot too much uh, besides drops because that's what the receiving core is about. So, yeah, not not really excited to lay the 10 on the road there, but uh, I, I sure as hell am not taking Virginia with the points. So I, I guess just hands off of the spread on this one. Moving forward to uh, Mountain West after dark, the absolute pinnacle of college football uh, before Tuesday night maction. This is the best we got right now. We have Boise State, a seven-point favorite on the road at San Diego State. This game carries an over-under of 45.5 points. Kicks off at 10.30 p.m. Eastern. For those East Coasters like me, you definitely need a bonus cup of coffee on a Friday night here as kicks off on CBS Sports Network. Again, right where the Mountain West should be, I think. Boise State, interestingly, has won eight. uh, I'm sorry, has won their last eight Mountain West road openers. Again, not really actionable. Uh, It's a trend, but I thought it was interesting enough. At least they, they come prepared for these conference openers on the road. The running back, George Halani, he's missed the past two weeks. He got banged up in week one. Um, this backup, Ashton Genty, he has been really good in his, in his absence. He has six total touchdowns as a running back, mind you, 14 receptions for 263 yards and two receiving touchdowns. So a versatile athlete that really stretches the field. He's just been terrific for the Broncos. I was really excited to watch Taylor Green this year. He was one of my preseason just darlings. I was so excited to see him play football. Uh, but the passing production has just not been there for the uh, red shirt sophomore here. The Broncos are 125th in passing EPA. He has six turnover worthy throws and four picks. He's thrown at least one in every game so far, including against North Dakota last week he threw a pair against uh, Washington. Uh, he has a 70 and a half percent adjusted completion rate, which is fine. Not great. Uh, but he also has nine drops from his receivers. Mind you, uh, Latrell Caples, their, their leading receiver from last year, went down with a with a season-ending injury before the year even started. So he's thrown to some, you know, he's, he's trying to find his way around the, re- the rest of the receiving core there. I think they should be able to move the ball with consistency against San Diego, or, yeah, San Diego State's run defense. Uh, surprisingly, the, like shockingly, the Aztecs are 130th in rushing success rate, allowed nearly 54% of rushes uh, achieve what they're supposed to for uh, being uh, categorized as a successful play. Uh, they're uncharacteristically bad at tackling this year. They have the 13th most missed tackles through their four games played so far. Uh, they're also getting blown off the ball, and they're just not cleaning it up on the back end. So I think Boise State's going to find success on the ground here, uh, especially since that passing offense is still taking a while to get underway. Uh, and then San Diego State's offense, they they still stink. Uh, even under Ryan Lindley, they're 116th in pass EPA. Jalen Maiden, not not super uh, inspiring here. Seven turnover-worthy throws, four picks. He's taken 12 sacks. It's the fifth most nationally. Uh, it's just a typical San Diego State offense that we've seen from the past half decade or even decade. That is just, it's slow moving. It's not effective, not efficient. Uh, that's kind of how I break this one down. Uh, but how do your numbers see this game shaping out? Yeah, Boise State entered this season with a 60% chance to make the Mountain West Conference Championship game. That was the best in the conference. At number 60 overall, power rated, 
The Broncos are still the best, quote unquote, team in the conference by my numbers. However, their conference championship game appearance chances are down to 39%. That's third best in the conference behind Fresno State and Air Force currently. So in this one, I have Boise State minus 6.5, 68% win expectancy. The offense is actually slightly improved from what it was in the preseason, now ranks number 58. That's best in the conference. The defense, though, is down from number 36 to number 63. Boise State's regular season win total projection down from 8.1 to 6.9. But there are only two games remaining this season in which I project Boise State to be an underdog. Week 5 at Memphis, it's a non-conference game. And Week 2 at Fresno State, that's the only conference game all year that Boise State, by my numbers, projected to be an underdog. And that's it's really interesting to hear your numbers and how they change offensively and defensively because the way that I, I see it with my own eyes, and of course, you know, those lie, numbers aren't lying as much, I, that I think that their offense, to me, has uh, underwhelmed while their defense has maybe improved a bit or, or played to expectation, but your numbers don't agree, like, at all. You're saying the defense is way down, uh, and that offense, you, like you said, slightly improved. So that's interesting to hear. Well, and as I, as I take a, a, a closer look, since you brought that up, as I look into the spreadsheets here, the, off, the offensive rank is up from 61 to 58, and that's what I publish for unit, offensive unit defense rankings. I don't publish the rating. Their actual rating is down slightly, so I'll give you that. Even though the ranking is up, the rating is down. The defense, part of it is, Brett, I, I and, and maybe it's you know a misprojection on my part. Maybe coming into the year, I thought Boise State's defense was going to be better than your eyes thought or that, than you thought with your opinion. I had them number 36. Now they're number 63. If you, though, thought coming in, you know, they're a mid-60 or number 70, then it would make sense that you're like, hey, they, you know, they've, they've actually improved or overachieved. So as, as I'm talking about these things, it's important to remember I'm talking about improvement and regression from the context of how was I projecting in the preseason for right or wrong. I always say this more times than not through back testing and through just results of over the course of the last five, six years, my numbers are right more than they're wrong. They are not right every time. If they were, I wouldn't be on this podcast talking to you. I'd probably be working for some Vegas uh, casino and making a bunch of money, but that's okay. They're right more than they're wrong, and it gives us, it gives me context and a lens through which I can view teams and conference races kind of as a starting point, and then I love all the context that you add and all the other storylines that come into it, too, beyond the numbers, because you need both. You need the numbers, and you need the additional context to fully understand what these teams are all about, and even with all that... At the end of the day, you're playing with an oblong ball. you got 18 to 22-year-olds, a bounce here, a bounce there, a bad decision, a missed field goal. You still don't get it right all the time. So that's why we love this game because it's so unpredictable. Um, but, yes, that's just important to, to keep in mind, too, as I'm talking about this stuff. Um, where am I here? San Diego State. Here we go. I'll switch gears. Uh, this is game five of the year for them. Uh, now, granted, only one of them has been on the road, and that was last week at Oregon State. We might start to see some wear and tear on this team. Maybe not yet. Maybe, you know, next week when they go to Air Force before getting their first buy of the year uh, and then turning around and going to Hawaii. This team, as we continue to talk about them, could potentially, all these Mountain West teams who are, you got to go a long way. You're flying to every single game when you're playing in the Mountain West or you're playing in the Pac-12 out there. It's a long way. And so as you play consecutive games, five, six games in a row without a bye, wear and tear is a real thing. And so we might start to see that this week, I think. Offense has been exactly what I projected. Again, preseason projections versus what I'm looking at now. Number 110 coming into the season, number 110 currently. So they've been exactly what I projected. It's not very good, though. Um, the defense has been poor. They've fallen from number 52 to number 77. Coming off back-to-back -back games against Pac-12 opponents, the Aztecs are not going to be intimidated in this one. But I do give the Broncos the edge on both sides of the ball here. It's been pretty cut and dry for San Diego State so far this year. They've beaten the teams in which they were favored, favored to beat, and they've lost to the teams where they were the underdog. So it's funny how that works out uh, sometimes with teams, other times not so much, as I talked about with Purdue earlier. But it has worked out that way for San Diego State this year. Uh, I have Boise State minus 6.5. It's a 32% chance San Diego State pulls off the upset win at home. Boise State. I mentioned earlier, 39% chance to make the conference championship game currently with a win that jumps up to 47. With a loss, it drops to 21, uh, which is kind of crazy to think about uh, for a Boise State team that coming in, I gave a 60% chance to make it. San Diego State, currently a 6% chance. You get a win against a really good Boise State team, best in your conference by my numbers, up to 15%. A loss drops you to 3%. Okay, moving on to the final matchup that we have here on our weekday slate. We're staying in the Mountain West after dark. 
We have Air Force, a three and a half point favorite on the road at San Jose State. This game has an over under of 47. It also kicks off at 10.30 p.m. Eastern on FS1. Get those YouTube TV multi-views ready to go as you tuck yourself into bed and grab just, an extra or cup just of coffee. Come over to, just come over to my basement, Brett, right? Yeah, come or, on over. Yep, or visit Kelly and if you're in the Indianapolis area. <laughs> Central adjacent. Indiana, y'all, y'all come over. <laughs> shoot me a DM. We'll see what's going on. Uh, there seems to be buyback at Air Force when it hits uh, minus three. Uh, the second it touches there, it, it rebounds almost immediately. Uh, for San Jose State, their top receiver, Justin Lockhart, he still hasn't played this year. Uh, he's, quote-unquote, out indefinitely uh, with a uh, arm injury. San Jose State actually released a statement before week zero saying that we are not going to report the status of our players' injuries. Just like a gigantic middle finger in a year that a lot of teams are getting better with reporting injuries. They said, nope, absolutely not. Um, but yeah, the, the latest report on him is that he is out indefinitely. I, uh, the Spartans, this is also an interesting scheduling conundrum. I know you like bringing the schedule stuff, so I don't want to step on your toes too much here, but they're returning home and they're playing at home, which is great. Uh, after playing at Toledo, which is a cross country mm-hmm. trip for them while air force actually has a bonus day of rest and played at home last time. So despite the fact that San Jose state is at home, uh, Air Force actually has the travel and rest advantage coming into this game, which I don't think is uh, it, it's it's not nothing. That's for sure. Uh, Chevin Cordero, he's been uh, balling out uh, even without Justin Lockhart uh, for him. He has 12 what PFF identifies as tw- uh, big time throws, and he's shown really good escapability and instinct. Um, but there's one really gigantic problem. If we are stripping this down to the absolute most basic blocks of football, San Jose State cannot defend the run very well, and Air Force runs the absolute heck out of the football. Uh, They stopped Toledo just five times uh, for two yards or less on 35 rush attempts. Not great. Uh, The Spartans have not been getting the push up front. They have not been cleaning up with their linebackers near at the line of scrimmage. Um, You know, I I also think this is a little bit of an issue with, like, you know, they've defended USC and Oregon State, two of the better rushing teams in the country, so you can't fault them too much there. But again, again, when they went to Toledo, Toledo was able to get a push up front and run the football and did not get stopped very often. But there is one big disparity, and I do have to shout out Brad Powers on, on Twitter for, for sharing this. This is his bit of info, but I'm going to take it. Uh, their strength of schedule currently, San Jose State has played the 19th most difficult schedule in the country, while Air Force has played the 111th strength of schedule. So there's a big disparity there, and that does matter when you're considering these teams that one has not played a very tough schedule so far. The other one's kind of been through it. Uh, that does give an upper hand to San Jose State just a tad bit. I didn't even see that, Brett, and I'm glad you talked about it because it's a good segue into what I wanted to touch on here with these two teams. So bear with me for just a few seconds before I get into the two teams and what the numbers say about them. Air Force is 3-0. and They have 0.3 more wins than I projected through week three in the preseason. San Jose State is 1-3 and has 0.5 fewer wins than I projected through week three in the preseason. Despite vastly different records, 3-0 and versus 1-3, and these two teams are both within a half game of what my preseason realistic expectations were, which is pretty darn good through this many games. I say this to highlight simply how significant the schedule disparity is in college football. I didn't even know you were going to talk about what you just did, and Brad Powers is out there saying it too. I, I was planning on saying this. Air Force has played FCS Robert Morris, number 126 power rated Sam Houston, and number 92 power rated Utah State, with none of those being true road games. The neutral site game against Sam Houston, the the only time they're away from home. San Jose State has played the number four power rated USC, at number 45 power rated Toledo, and home against number 19 power rated Oregon State, as well as FCS Cal Cal Poly. So 3-0 Air Force at 1-3 San Jose State. Air Force should be a huge favorite, right? No, the numbers, my numbers make this a pick I know what the spread is. My numbers make it a pick 51% win expectancy for the Falcons. Schedule, schedule, schedule. It matters. It's the context we need. Not all records are created equal in college football. Despite the weak schedule difficulty, Air Force has performed slightly better than the model expected, rising from number 70 in the preseason to number 67 currently. Both units have improved. The offense is up from number 107 to number 88. The defense from number 17 to number 10. Brett, this defense is legit. It's the best in the country by far. I understand. Anytime you're talking about service academies, and I know it's a little bit different now at Navy than it's been, but anytime you're talking about service academies, people say, oh, just throw that out because they play weird stuff and they play the game differently and their offense, you just can't take it seriously. 
This defense is legit. I'm only projecting the Falcons as underdogs in one game the rest of the way. It's the final game of the year at Boise State, a game that could have massive conference championship game implications uh, if things play out the way the numbers suggest. They now have a 45% chance to make the conference championship game. That is second behind only Fresno State. I talked about fatigue possibly setting in for San Diego State. Same is true for San Jose State, who has already played four games, and it could be worse even for the Spartans, who have already played two true road games, including last week's trip, as you mentioned, across the country to Toledo, Ohio. So again, always talk about the schedule, Brett, uh, both of us. We can't, you can't emphasize enough scheduling dynamics, and that is something that is not explicitly factored into my model. I that, Trust me, that is on my wish list of things that I would like to do, but uh, I haven't gotten to that point where I'm comfortable putting in an actual input that I feel comfortable waiting such that it can improve the overall predictive accuracy of them. But it's absolutely a part of the context that we need to talk about. I, uh, it, Oh, so I, I I lost my train of thought there for like half a second. So if you read uh, my articles, I'm going to shamelessly plug at the lines. I do an upset alert article each week and it's basically all done on scheduling spots. It, it's not, usually, hey, I have this rated, you know, I make this a different line than what the market's giving you. It's often, hey, this team just went here. They have a look-ahead spot. This other team has a, has a rest advantage. Well, those teams that have highlighted, 10 of them on the year, 10 games, are 8-2 and two against the spread with two outright upsets. And, and I don't choose plus two underdogs. I'm choosing seven, eight, nine, or more double-digit underdogs. Uh, last week, just to pat myself on the back a little bit, uh, I had Idaho covering the spread against Cal and Weber State covering the spread against Utah. They both did those things. So uh, shameless plug, please read my uh, upset alert articles. Uh, they're doing pretty well. And it's based solely on those scheduling spots and some beat up injuries. So I'm glad that you're uh, pointing that out too, Kelly. Eight and two against the spread with two outright winners. Uh, yeah, guys, if you're not reading Brett's upset articles and you like to bet college football, I don't like to bet college football, but I'm still going to read the articles. Uh, you should too and take those betting nuggets uh, without a doubt. So yeah, can't overemphasize that. That's awesome. I love it, Brett. Um, I'll switch gears to San Jose State. Despite the one and three record, San Jose State has also improved on all fronts since the preseason. That's been a theme tonight. Either both teams have been regressing on all fronts or improving all, all fronts, which makes for competitive games. Uh, the offense is up from number 91 to number 81. The defense is up from number 93 to number 90, so just slightly there, uh, leading to an overall improvement from number 93 to number 77. Again, wins and losses are not inputs into the predictive model used for power ratings. It's all about performance relative to expectation. So even though they're one and three, the model is saying, hey, you're actually a better team than we thought you were because of how you played in these games. And again, I talked about that schedule that they played, you know, USC, um, Oregon State, Toledo is the best team in the MAC on the road. So all these things go into it. You're actually a better team than we thought by the model standpoint. Moving forward, we're going to judge you that way. And you need to keep playing at that level, San Jose State, to avoid falling uh, down in the model again. Even with the number three offense in the conference, my numbers uh, favor Air Force by the slightest of margins. The difference could be the home field advantage here, uh, even though you talked about the rest advantage actually being for Air Force. I have this as a pick 49% win expectancy for San Jose State at home. Here we go. Air Force, 45% chance to make the conference championship game currently. With a win, it's up to 60. That's a significant jump up. With a loss, 29%. This is a big swing game. Again, there's only eight conference games in the Mountain West. So this is 12.5% of your conference schedule. Yeah, you're going to get a swing of 15% in either direction almost every week. I mean, if it's a, if it's a semi-close matchup, which this one doesn't get any closer, I have it as a pick em. San Jose State, 23% chance currently to make the conference championship game uh, with a win. That's up to 35%. With a loss, it's down to 11%. So it's a 12% swing for San Jose State in either direction. Yeah, I don't love the spot or the matchup for San Jose State here. Again, not being able to defend the run very well against Air Force, one of the best rushing teams over the past decade. Uh, and then, like we said, the the travel disadvantage, the the slight rest disadvantage, those are all things going against San Jose State. But when you're talking about a low-scoring conference game, I can understand leaning the home dog in this spot. Uh, I, I don't hate it at all, especially at 3.5, that 3 being the most significant key figure in football betting. Uh, I think if I do have to put a lean out here, I have not played this yet, but I think I may uh, soon here. Air Force minus two and a half in the first half. Uh, I anticipate them being to come out, run the football with a lot of success, 
Uh, Cordero tends to play his best ball when he's kind of like let off the leash, let loose, and playing from behind, at least that's what I've seen over the past year and a half. And I uh, have to bring it up, the Troy Calhoun stat continues to cover the spread at a 65% clip over 17 seasons. So bet against Air Force at your own peril. Uh, but yeah, if, if I have to throw something out there, Air Force first half minus two and a half. I think they can cover a field goal spread uh, to, uh, out of the gate here, especially with the slight rest advantage. But Kelly, that's 45 minutes on Thursday and Friday night college football. Not a single ranked opponent to be seen. And yet we're out here breaking these down to the absolute granular degree. If you'd like to see more breakdowns and hear continue discussions, hop on over to our Discord server where you can connect with over 4,000 sports betting fans and get live updates in the college football channel. Join a sharp and active community. It's, it's just all the time. There are people in there 24-7 talking all levels of college football. Absolutely love that channel there. Don't forget to subscribe to Align's YouTube for weekly college football odds and betting videos all season long. And subscribe to us on your podcasting app of choice, be it Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, whoever's carrying us these days. And if you really like the show, be sure to drop us a good review that's going to help us reach more college football fans. Kelly, before we close up shop here, please let everyone know where they can find your work. Absolutely. You can find me on X at K Ford Ratings. You can find my website, kfordratings.com. It's got all the things that I'm posting on social media, uh, doing writing for the lines.com over uh, top three games of the week in the watchability scores, and then also the NBC primetime game of the week, which nothing against the three games that I've written about to date. But this week, it's Notre Dame, Ohio State. So uh, if you haven't read any of the NBC primetime games yet, this is the one to jump in on. If you have, I really appreciate your dedication and uh, looking forward to writing about a really great game here, as well as the top three games of the week, uh, as I've done uh, every week for the lines.com. And if you are keeping up with Kelly's NBC primetime breakdowns, you'd have known that Syracuse was the correct side last That's week true. as you projected them as an eight and a half point favorite and they cover their two and a half point spread with ease i know that is something that i took uh so thank you kelly i appreciate that but thanks as always for watching i am brett gibbons that is kelly ford and we'll see you all next time